Hello and welcome into the Sporting Pod, along with Tony Allegretti and Mauricio Ruiz. I'm Cole Pepper. Today on the pod, a closer look at Bolivia, the USMNT's first opponent in Copa America. Euro 24 off to a roaring start, how the favorites have fared so far. And looking toward the playoffs, Florida Elite's USL2 team is knocking on the doorstep. A reminder, we are fed by the Bearded Pig, locally owned and operated with locations in San Marco and Jack's Beach. Make sure you swing by the Bearded Pig for great barbecue and great time. <laughs> There's Tony, who is bearded. Our official bearded pig. I will not comment on the uh, I'm fasting. other point. It's okay. <laughs> Listen, you're always fast. Um, okay, quickly, a lot going on. I don't bear with us. Um, you know, we usually, again, try to shoot for like 20-some minutes, under 30 minutes on this pod. But there is so much going on right now that I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. We'll, we'll do our best. But if we go long, then it's too— yeah. Set your sleep timer. Yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. It, adjust your circadian rhythms, and we'll get through all of this. Um, first and foremost, the Premier League uh, coming to Jacksonville. We've talked about uh, West Ham and, and Wolves coming to play on July the 27th as part of the Stateside Cup. Tickets are on sale now. Also, be on the lookout for information about a youth soccer clinic that will be a great way for young soccer players to get, uh, Mauricio, a little bit of coaching and uh, maybe get a little flavor of the Premier League. We absolutely, and I think if we um, we're trying to pull together with West Ham and Wolves former players and coaches, and so it's just a really good opportunity for the community to come out together collectively. Um, unrelated to club soccer, just just a good, cool opportunity to come together and watch a game, play some soccer together, um, get to meet some former pros um, from the Pram, which you, you really, we don't have access to all the time. Um, so that'll be, that'll be a lot of fun. Are we um, talking about, <laughs> we should really do this before, I should ask my questions before the podcast, I think, but are we talking about uh, the activation with kids yet or uh, maybe next co- not, podcast? Not officially yet, okay, so okay. thanks for doing yeah. your prep work, Tony, Sorry, as yeah. always, and mm-hmm. coming prepared to the podcast. You see, we run a very professional tight ship over here. <laughs> it's called the tease, Mauricio. The tease, like, okay. Yes. Now, in, in, to... Industry term, I guess. Exactly, yes. yes. Another industry term. Uh, this one we can say on the air. Um, so we'll get more about that as we get closer, but I think it's going to be a great day for uh, soccer in Jacksonville, July the 27th. Bring your kids. Bring your kids. All right. Copa America uh, gets underway on Sunday for the United States as they take on Bolivia as part of Group C play. Uruguay and Panama are the other opponents in Group C. Uh, arguably the most talented collection of players that the U.S. has had in U.S. men's national team history. If you talk about playing at the at the you know in the biggest leagues, the, the highest uh, level in the world, I'm not going to put more than it should be put into based on the warm up games against Colombia and Brazil, either good or bad. But Mauricio, number one, do you agree with the thought of this being the most talented U.S. group um, and the group that obviously is being groomed to get ready for? the World Cup in 2026, but um, the expectations for what can happen this year in Copa America, the biggest uh, club soccer tournament in, in this hemisphere uh, uh, and being played on home soil is is very high, certainly was before the two friendlies. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, if, if it's to answer that first question just on on its own, yes, from a talent standpoint, um, I think a lot of the former U.S. national team players, like Dempsey's of the world, they will tell you, and and they have publicly said this is this this is the most collectively talented group that we've ever had. Now they will also say, and I would agree with this, is is the most ready, right? Do we have enough maturity and grit within this group? And I think we're finding out that you know based on that Brazil game, there is it's there, but does that mentality of kind of being that American underdog and that fighter? Can that can be combined with the talent that we have? And once those two things come together, I think we have a beautiful product. And I think we have a product that can compete. I'm not saying win, because winning is subjective to conditions of the game. But can we compete with the best of the world? And can we compete in Copa America? A hundred percent. We need to see that come together more consistently, right? We see it oftentimes in moments. So uh, I think that's what this, this Copa America is about. Yeah, I uh, wholeheartedly agree. I I think the big X factor for me is um, if they're going to play for the coach. If they're you know they they really showed in Brazil 
um, a team unity. And if they, if, and these guys can do it, if they can transcend sort of that kind of outlying thing, weird, we were just watching today the uh, Southgate triple sub, but you know, <laughs> Jared Bowen got on, you know, so West Ham, he'll be in the house uh, next month. Um, the, the, the thought is for me is can they just keep it together and it won't matter um, really what the lineup is, what situation we're going to come out and, um, and play ball. I think we're fine. All right, so Bolivia, the first uh, meeting in the group, United States and Bolivia have met eight times since 1993, with each side winning two matches and drawing the remaining four. Sunday's uh, matchup marks the second meeting in the Copa America. Back in 1995, the U.S. lost to Bolivia 1-0 in Uruguay. The uh, men's national team ranks 11th in the FIFA World Rankings. Bolivia is ranked 85th. Bolivia tuned up for the Copa America with losses to Mexico, Ecuador, and Colombia. Um, and you can certainly say that the expectation is that the United States will win this first matchup, but we'll see how it all goes down. Bolivia does have one Copa America title that came in 1963, so a little bit of background there. And, of course, we will be watching the Copa America at Grace Note Brewing for the first of three uh, watch parties that we have set up for Copa America at Grace Note Brewing under the Roosevelt Bridge there between Avondale and Ortega. So uh, Sundays, the game starts at 6 o'clock. Get there a little bit early. If you are a season ticket depositor, you could buy one, get one free beers while the match is going and the watch party is ongoing. And uh, please, RSVP by going to sportingjacks.com. Should be a lot of fun to watch that match. And then we'll see what happens as they go against Panama and then Uruguay, which is really going to be, I think, probably the pivotal um, match. Mauricio, as you mentioned, I think, last week, the, the United States, is, is, the way that the bracket works out, um, is likely to face either Brazil or Colombia in the first knockout game if they get through. Interesting that those are the teams that are bracketed that way. And uh, so the United States now uh, will have some sense of, of who you know who they will be place, uh, facing and how they play um, after playing friendlies against those two if they get through the group. Well, and I think that was a strategic looking at the groups the way they are set up, that you're going to play one of those two, so go ahead and kind of test yourself in a friendly environment, but at least you can kind of test uh, test drive the you know the game, if you would, as best as you can. Yeah, and I think they'll come out with confidence from learned lessons from the Columbia game, that they can, if they play that game 10 more times, they will give themselves a, a better opportunity, and then certainly the, the performance against Brazil is something to kind of hang your head on, at least for the time being. Yeah. It's tournament time too, so kind of I, I would throw out some of that who's going to be one or two in their group because every time you overachieve and become one, something happens and you know Saudi Arabia beats Argentina and now you're facing them. You know, it's yeah. just it, it can get it can get weird. Well, yes, agreed. Um, to me, that group of with Colombia and Brazil. Um, I mean, that's pretty top heavy. I know, but until you mentioned it, um, uh, the 1963 trophy, I would have not believed you. He'll be here all week with the dad <laughs> jokes. Uh, please tip your waiter and waitresses before you go. Um, all right. Uh, th- there's a bunch of USL and USL Super League kind of business that has happened. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on hold. We'll circle back to it because we have so much to talk about here this week, it, stuff that's not necessarily specific to this week, but we'll, we'll get to that probably in the next couple of podcasts. Something that is uh, timely is USL 2, Florida Elite, right now with two games remaining uh, on the doorstep of the playoffs. We've talked about uh, the USLW team being number one in the country, but the USL 2 men's team having a, another strong season and um, – they need a couple of things to fall just right for them, but um, Mauricio, they're, they're, they have a chance to make the playoffs as well. So uh, it's been a very strong uh, season, a very strong summer for the uh, Florida Elite uh, top teams. It really has, and it's it's kind of rare when you see both the on the boys and on the girls' side, the team do extremely well, and I think they're feeding off of each other a little bit. The other two teams that are competing on the men's side, you know, the villages out of the village's area. Uh, um, they're called the Braves FC, uh, SC now, and then uh, Nona Soccer Academy out of Orlando. So the boys have a little more competition, and they're all, you know, they're all kind of picking points away from each other. Um, the boys here, Florida Lee, face the Braves SC out of the villages in their next game. So I think that's a really big determining, 
game for them. As you mentioned, they have games in hand right now where they've played the majority of their schedule. But man, can we talk about these young ladies? They're just on fire. I mean, the next best team is Tampa with only one loss, with two losses, which is is to Florida Lee. But I think we're on a 70 to 6 goal differential, which if my math is correct, is 64 plus. I'll get back to you on that to mm-hmm. confirm. But yeah, that's it's it's dominant. And um, you know, the, the the number two team in the nation in uh, the USLW, uh, displaced former number one, is uh, is a club you got a chance to see, Tony, when you were up in Detroit. Yeah, Detroit City FC really looked sharp. I will tell you, and this is not just being a homer. I think um, Florida Elite could take them. They were really, they were really good. In fact, I, it's some Michigan team that they were playing uh, uh, when I was there, and I can't remember the name, but they were also very good. And had a lot of. I mean, these are these are um, these are amazing players. There's another game uh, when I was um, in Detroit uh, that I didn't catch, but I watched it on the. Um, the thing is, Corktown has a team. So this this is the great thing about soccer in America right now is there's big cities like ours, Detroit, et cetera, have multiple teams, and they're, they're all um, well attended. Um, and so Corktown's got a great little uh, scene. It was great. But um, the most impressive thing about DCFC was their fan base. So it was now, granted, it was after a championship game. Um, but everyone stayed. I mean, it was impossible to get food. It was like, uh, it was really, I'd say uh, if there were seven, I think the the attendance, the announced attendance was 7,100, probably at least 6,000 for the women's game. So it was was really impressive for W League. So I I did want to, um, both of you have had uh, trips, uh, working uh, trips here in the soccer landscape over the last week. I want to get sort of the vacation slides for both of you there. But I do want to remind everybody that you can become a member of Sporting Jacks. Just go to SportingJacks.com. It's absolutely free. You can get invitations to attend exclusive insider events, automatic chances to win special prizes and experiences, discounts on club merchandise. Plus, you'll receive the Sporting Jacks email newsletter. And while you're there, you can place a deposit on season tickets and receive first access to seats and a special limited edition Sporting Jacks founding member pin. Again, SportingJacks.com. And if you are a season ticket depositor, 25 bucks for the men or women, 40 for both, you will get buy one, get one free beers at our next three watch parties uh, during the Copa America group stage matches for the U.S. at Grace Note Brewing. All right. Uh, as mentioned, Tony was in Detroit. Mauricio, you were in Nashville. Um Tony, let's go with you uh, on some of the other things you saw while you're in Detroit. Yeah, thanks, Cole. So um, the real purpose for me to go up th- during this weekend was to um, – they're doing an installation of these mini pitches. There's a commitment by the U.S. Soccer Foundation to put a 1,000 mini pitches in, um, mostly in areas that don't have soccer, have uh, relatively little access to soccer. Um, a very good program. They're at 700 plus already, so they're going to hit their market. The the, the deadline's uh, 2026 for the for the World Cup. Um, I really wanted to talk to um, the U.S. Uh, Foundation, but also um, Black Star, which is a division of Four Soccer, which is heavily a part of this because we're in we're in um, neighborhoods that are are distressed. That are, that um, again, um, a high amount of um, of interest, just not the access. The, the game's not there and the facilities aren't there. So that's what these mini pitches really help do is bridge that gap. Um, just so happened to be that Tyler uh, Adams was there and that was amazing. And in, in, in his um, remarks to the kids, and the kids were in rap, I mean, like you would be if you were a, a soccer kid. Um, and he, he he said, and I'll paraphrase a little bit here, He's like, you know, it's great to be a great soccer player. It's great to be able to do what you love and the game that you love. He's like, but the most important thing in life is to be a good person. And it was like, okay. It was awesome. And the kids were listening. I mean, I was listening. I, mean, I, I, got, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. He's a, he's a solid leader. He's yeah. an amazing person. Well, well if that uh, remark that he had in the World Cup on the Iranian reporter – Kind of corrected him, you know. So it's it's Iran, not Iran. If you know, you know, it's it's, it's Americanized because we say Brazil differently than how I would say Brazil as a Brazilian. Um, so I thought it was a little bit, but it's fine. Like he respected, and he honored it, and the the fact that he has the composure in that moment in time to not be defensive and not to take offense to it, uh, and he was able to articulate his response speaks a lot to his character and how he owns the captain's band 
today because he is the the beacon and the voice of the U.S. national team. So it's great to when you actually see someone on TV or you see how they behave, but you actually get to interact and meet with them. And there's a lot of consistency and the dots connect. Uh, I think it's really neat to hear that from the captain of our, our U.S. national team. All right. Then, um, it, Tony, anything else from Detroit that really stuck out in your mind you think um, uh, will lend a little uh, background, a little behind-the-scenes action for the listeners of the pod? So um, just just some an- anecdotal things. The um, I did try to catch as much Euro as I could there. So I'm in the pubs, I'm, you know, kind of close to downtown. And um, I had to ask them to turn on the TV, you know. And I, I think about Jacksonville and our international city. And, like, we have – I mean, if you think about, like, Tinseltown, it's almost Watch Party USA. There's, you know, the Bottlenose and the in the um, uh, Colhanes and Island Wings, et cetera. And we're, you know, we're doing Grace Note coming up. And we've got watch parties everywhere. Like, I literally had to get them to turn on the TV, which is cool. I mean, it, you know – um uh it, it was that that part was different but one thing um downtown especially is um uh people asked what i do uh, etc and i said well, you know what i was there for and um they were really excited that the um that the stadium is moving from keyboard down closer to downtown and, and really in a more sort of densely populated area than where it is now at hamtramck yeah that, we talked about that a couple of uh, months ago it's exciting uh, to, for detroit to have uh, that burgeoning uh, opportunity around the soccer community. Mauricio, you were in Nashville, part of your duties with um, U.S. Soccer. You want to uh, give everybody a little bit of a flavor of what you're doing and, and what you learned? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's funny to talk about Tyler Adams because this week there's a lot of conversations around Christian Pulisic and Tyler Adams as two of really U.S. Um, born and developed products. You look at Weston McKinney as well and a couple, and there's several others, but we talked about a lot sometimes about the transplants, right, that are already in Europe early or they're dual, dual Americans or dual citizens, but we do have a lot of them that are currently have been raised through the system. So as part of, as part of my role as U.S. Soccer Scout, we're there at a large um, national event with a lot of the top academies identifying what are 2010s now? So there are you, you 14, 13 year olds, um, and 14 year olds, looking at high prospect players, players that can make the next level. And it, when we get together as, as scouts from all over the regions, we, we start having these conversations, right? What's happening in youth development around the country? Who are the clubs that are doing a good job? Who are the clubs that have improvement to be made? What does the coaching look like? The education environment, and ultimately, how are we identifying and developing? not just soccer players, but similar, and I share that with you guys offline, just to focus right now on just good leadership, on making sure that we are not, we're coaching, holding kids to a high standard, high accountability, high demand, c- competitive nature, but making sure we're doing it in a way that we're also growing uh, young people in the right way, such as the Tyler Adams of the world. And and, and none of them are gonna be perfect. And you see Pulisic McKinney sometimes having just a bit of that fire and that fight, but they're good people, right? They come around them. They're just they're good people in our national team now. And I think that speaks a lot about what U.S. soccer is doing to try to identify and develop them, not just as soccer players, because that's a hard thing to do. The country's so big. Can we keep educating our coaches and our environment, but make sure that we're also educating them as good people too? I, I do, and I know some of this I know you can't discuss on the pod right now uh, at this point, but um, you know, again, a lot of people talking to you about what's happening in Jacksonville while you're out uh, on the road at these scouting opportunities, uh, the excitement of what's happening here, and the interest on both the men's and the women's side. Um, it continues to be at a you know a increasing level almost each and every time you go out, you come back and there's you know even more you know high level interest. Well, it, it, it is because the it's growth, right? It's growth of the game, and there are, there are only so many large areas of the country that are still somewhat untapped. And Jacksonville is one of them. So when I mentioned, oh, well, you know, where are you from? I said, in Florida. Where in Florida? Orlando, Miami. I'm like, no, I'm in, I'm in Jacksonville. Oh, what's going on in Jacksonville? A lot of them already know uh, by, by, by just relationships. So I was like, yeah, Jacksonville's a great market. And so everyone knows of the market of Jacksonville, that we're still the largest city that doesn't have, in, in a DMA that doesn't have um, professional soccer. And now we could potentially have two in the next, you know, two-year cycle and then add a women's tier one, you know, professional team. Um, so it's an emerging market and it's a bit of untapped. So um, there's just a lot of interest and a lot of people that are very curious um, to potentially, you know, um, move and, and be place be placed here to help us build this. Yeah. I mean, very realistically, in a couple of years, we'll have Division Two in the championship, uh, Division Three with Next Pro. 
Um, I think personally, I think we could have another division three team just looking at the Nielsen, looking at the, the, mm-hmm. the numbers um, and, and just how far spread out we are just geographically. Yeah. I mean, there's um, I think there's a lot of um, momentum, plenty of players, plenty of um, interest and demand uh, for the product. I could I could see us having multiple. Teams. Well, and there's a, there's a lot of conversation just around the USL model and the question that like the, the the million dollar question about US soccer's promotion relegation always is right and I think US soccer has made themselves extremely open to that so it's a question of when and how it's going to happen not if it's going to happen uh, so there's just a lot of good conversation around that and if you see the League One the amount of teams that are coming up in League One there's a strategy behind that yeah I think there's a lot of question about who would be involved in yeah promotion relegation and who would not be which is almost certain to be MLS sure uh, yeah. but the model doesn't fit for them but uh, we'll see again that, that we can have the you know pro rel conversation until the cows come home and until the cows do come home it's uh, it's kind of more of the same, um, which we'll have a few of those uh, on the pod in the future. It is Calford. It is, absolutely. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's uh, shift our focus to the Euros um, happening in Germany and the home team so far as we record this, two wins in Group A, which almost certainly puts them through um, to uh, the next uh, the next stage. Um, they will be, be on in Group uh you know the other options there. We'll see. Switzerland has a win so far, a win and a draw, so four points. Switzerland probably goes through. We'll see with Scotland and Hungary uh, there. Um, as we record this, Spain and Italy both are on four points with a win and a draw, and um, that'll be an interesting uh, matchup moving forward out of Group B. Group C with England. We just saw uh, a draw today with Denmark. Denmark has two points. Uh, England with four, uh, almost assures them of a spot uh, in the next round. The Netherlands and France uh, both have played one game and won, so the three points each there in Group D. Uh, group E with Romania and Slovakia both in the same situation, one win, three points uh, through one match, and then Group F with Turkey and Portugal having won their opening matches. Um, this, I, I I think everybody would probably come up with, if you, if I ask everybody for their favorites at this point, who they thought would have a chance to win it, probably coming with most of the same teams. You're probably talking about the teams that represent the countries from the biggest leagues uh, in in Europe. You know, it, is there somebody outside of England, Germany, France, Spain, and Italy who you think have a chance to win this uh, this tournament? Tony, no, no either, no. Um, I was, I mean, maybe I'm a little biased, but also just from a soccer standpoint and, and players on the field, I think Portugal, right? I think they just have, if you look at Portugal up and down and where their players are playing, they don't, they're not taking a back seat to any of those teams uh, from, you know, from top to bottom. He's just, there's just always this big, you know, the star, the top of the tree is, is Ronaldo. And how does that all come together with him there? But I think the team is at a point now where this is for sure his last Euro. Can can there be a little bit of a, of the Messi World Cup push where they're playing for him? Um, but from on paper, it's probably the only other team outside of the kind of top four that you just mentioned there with the level of players that they have. Yeah, I'm still sticking with um, Italy. I, I get it on um, Portugal. Obviously, uh, they're stacked. I worry that they have a former Everton coach. <laughs> As you would, that would that would create worry. By the way, um, we I believe we are on a, a Cal Ripken esque streak. Um, when Tony is on the podcast, and Everton mention has happened, I think every show. The only thing that's interrupted that has been when Tony couldn't couldn't join the pod. It's good. It's good for ratings. It's like sweeps. Yeah, it, it you you bring in the the the, the big time uh, uh, story uh, each and every week on that. Uh, I have really enjoyed watching the action, and again, it goes back to a conversation we had a while back about um, soccer on television. The settings have been fantastic. Obviously, playing in Germany, you've got some great stadiums, you know, Bundesliga-level uh, stadiums and national uh, stadia. But the crowds have been unbelievable. I mean, just exactly what you'd want to see out of a big uh, tournament. Well, the ability to travel. I mean, we, we see it in the World Cup level, teams, you know, in fence traveling all over the world. But in when you do that in Germany and uh, the, the ease and how it is to just take a train or, or fly to move around. So you see some of the smaller nations – they're just, yeah, they, their representation, it's almost like half of the country's there. Yeah, and you love that too, Tony, to see um, those that kind of atmosphere in these matches, um, even in the group stage. I mean, this is, okay, if you're, if you're an England fan or you're a Germany fan or a France fan, whatever, you expect them to get out of the group stage. 
but for some of these other teams um, representing countries that maybe haven't uh, had a chance to, to, to play at this level in quite a few years. And when you consider that the last few big international tournaments have been a little wonky in some regard, either you talk about Qatar, uh, you know, th- that there was some difficulty in terms of travel there. Um, you know, obviously the pandemic impacted uh, uh, the last year or so. Um, this is sort of a return to normalcy in some regard. No, totally. And I think one of the major differences, too, is that it's during the summer, mm-hmm. right? So kids can go. You see the stands. It's full of kids. It's amazing. Um, you know, families can watch this and kids can watch these matches now. Um, it's not in the middle of school day. It's way better. Um, but you're right. The um, the atmospheres have been outstanding. I love seeing people on the streets. And I have to say, for Copa, um, the the photos coming out of Atlanta uh, with the Argentinians taking over is pretty um, pretty strong coffee too. All right, there there is another topic that I think I'm going to hold for a future podcast just for time's sake. Um, and as long as um, you guys are okay with this, uh, I do want to mention that next week when we do our uh, podcast. We are going to do it live at Grace Note Brewing uh, after the U.S. plays Panama. We're going to record it live there. So um, if you want to come out and uh, be a part of what's happening uh, with that, we certainly welcome you and we'll take some fan questions and interactions on the pod as well. I did want to close here with some of the things that are going on with USL championship teams. And there are a bunch that recently rolled out uh, announcements about international friendlies going on this off season. New Mexico United is going to take on FC Juarez on June the 19th. Uh, So they just did uh, last night, as a matter of fact. Uh, Detroit City playing um, Pumas of uh, Liga MX. Then you have uh, San Antonio uh, taking on uh, Saprissa. Saprissa. Costa Rica. Uh, in, um, in July. Also in July, uh, Louisville City has both Cancun FC and Eintracht coming in to play uh, on July 13th and, and July 30th. Uh, these are some of the, listen, to have um, Liga MX teams, great. To have Eintracht coming over to play uh, is, is fantastic. Uh, this is one of the real benefits of having a, a USL championship team. This is the level of international friendlies that that can be brought into a city that is really a great treat for soccer fans. It really is. And especially, you know, if we kind of narrow down here to to Jacksonville, Florida, how many of these teams that are on summer break right now in Europe that wouldn't want to come here and do a little bit of their preseason. So long, you know, going forward, yeah, we have, we have West Ham and Wolves coming this summer and it's a part of a a larger kind of, you know, promoting group that, that are bringing them. But Supporting Jacks will be able to attract the likes of the teams you mentioned, and I believe even more that will love to just be here by the beach for a couple for about a month or so and be able to get a scrimmage against them. Yeah, that's why they call it a friendly. I mean, just let's go to the beach, let's let's have fun. Um, let, I mean, we know um, that there's teams that sort of covet this place and want to come here, so we're looking forward to it. All right, we did get it in under half an hour. So kudos with my dad jokes with your dad we, jokes. We really ever can, can I just can I just say that we really need a camera in here to live because when I do my dad jokes, Mauricio has the funniest face, but I try not to laugh because it, you know no one really wants to laugh at your own joke. Right, and that funny face you, you said that's what you're yeah funny, calling funny face. Mm. Yeah, I can't take that's that away. So funny. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's nice of you. Again, uh, you can follow us on social media at Sporting underscore Jacks. Be sure to become a Sporting Jacks member for free at SportingJacks.com. And we will be back next week. You can also catch us on TV on uh, First Coast News stations, including ABC 25, Wednesdays at noon, then Saturdays at noon as well. And on our radio show weekly on Monday nights at 6 on 1010 XL. For Mauricio Ruiz and Tony Allegretti, I'm Cole Pepper. Thanks for listening to The Sporting Pod.